there are various fresh approaches to make a company presence appear as meaningful to its potential audience. And this can be possibly achieved by creating experience. Hi, I'm Kira Kodri and you're watching The Leaderonomic Show. In this episode, Roshan Thiran will be speaking to Joseph Pine II, who is a speaker and management advisor to Fortune 500 companies who have also written several award-winning business books. According to Pine, by staging experience, it helps to leave memorable and lucrative impression that engage people. But with frequent use of digital gadgets, how do we deliver experience on the technology platform? Watch this interview with Joseph Pine II only on The Lead Army Show. Welcome to the Leadernomic Show. I'm with Joe Pine, author, speaker, and consultant. Um, Joseph, welcome to our show. Thank Glad to have you here with us. Yes, my pleasure. Tell us a bit about yourself. I mean, you started with IBM, um, and you basically transitioned to becoming an author, speaker, right, and a motivational right. uh, person. How, how did that happen? Uh, what took place? And you know, what are some of the learnings you've garnered along the journey? You know, I, I was always a math geek and a computer geek and that. Uh, although my wife would tell you I was really a nerd, not a geek. Okay. Uh, so I did, I got an applied mathematics degree. I joined IBM, started in very technical jobs. But for some reason, very early in my career, I realized I wanted to move into manage management and become an executive in that. So I started reading like the Harvard Business Review and that, and I moved into management very early. And then I got a special assignment for the uh, creation of our AS400 computer system. This okay. is now 25 years ago, sure. almost 30 years ago. Yep. And I, I, I brought customers and business partners into the development process of the system. And what I learned from that was that every customer was unique. Mm. Every one of them wanted to use the system in different ways, combine it with different hardware, different software, and so forth. They were unremittingly unique. And uh, we had no way of resolving that. We designed the system for a large, homogenous, multi- uh, or general purpose uh, computer market that, that simply didn't exist. So that sent me off in, into a search as I moved into strategic planning, and I read Stan Davis's book, Future Perfect. And, and when I read Future Perfect, this book came out in 1987, it was like the heavens opened up and the angels sang, because it explained everything that I was seeing. And he had this chapter in there called Mass Customizing. And he talked about how technology was bringing down the cost of customization so that we should be able to give everybody exactly what they want, but do it at a price they're willing to pay. And so I worked that into our plans and strategies at IBM, and then they sent me to MIT f for a year as a reward okay. to get my master's degree. And I found out I had to write a thesis, so I said, well, I'm going to write a thesis I can turn into a book. And so my entire year at MIT I spent was researching mass customization. Okay. And I got that, I, I finished the thesis, I got a contract with Harvard Business School to be able to publish a book. Okay, so that's how the first book came about? That's how the first book came about. It was, it was late 1992 that the book was actually uh, published. And about six months later, IBM actually offered both my wife and I six months salary to leave. You know, they're trying to, to, wow. to reduce the number of people in the corporation. So we decided to, to step out there and, and see if I could make it on my own. Uh, and so I, I formed a small company, uh, started doing speaking, teaching, consulting around the world. And 22 years later, my wife still isn't sure it's going to work out, you know, but, but so far, so good. <laughs> and, and, and this book, The Mass Customization, you know, what, what's the deep insight that that, that book professes? Well, the, the, the main thing is to recognize is that we don't have to live with mass production anymore. You know, mass production was, was like Henry Ford's famous statement that you can have any color car you want as long as it's black. Yep. And, I mean, it was great for its time because it lowered the cost of producing things so that the masses could get them. But the problem was is that we had to sacrifice our individual desires in order to buy something standard. And so what mass customization says is, is, is you don't have to do that. Is that you can get uh, products, goods, services, and even experiences at low cost, high volume, with efficient operations, 
but in a way that allows you to get exactly what you want. And, and this probably led to the next book, The Exper Experience Economy, right? Yes, it did, because I, I realized that mass customizing a good automatically turns it into a service. And ask the question, well, what does mass customization turn a service into? And if you, if you customize a service for a person, if you, if you give it exactly the right service, exactly what they need at this moment in time, then you can't help but turn it into a memorable event and, and, and make people go, wow. And so that is an experience. Give, it, give us an example of that. How do companies do that, I mean, in real life? Uh, well, there, there's many different ways that they can do it. You know, one of my favorite examples that I've been to a number of times is, uh, is Kidzania, okay. which I know you have here in, in Kuala Lumpur. And uh, originally started in Mexico City as La Ciudad de los Niños, or, or Kid City. And they have a great theme of, of playing adult roles. The kids play an admission fee, and then they get the run of the place where you get to play all of these adult roles through there. Uh, they get to uh, 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 you know, do your hair in a beauty parlor. You yep. go through a shaving experience. They get yep. to uh, sell you groceries in Absolutely. a grocery store. And interestingly, all of them are sponsored you know, by multinational or, or local companies. So it's really a marketing experience that they have for kids and their parents. And you know, I've, I've been to Disney theme parks all over the world, and I would swear that the, that the, that the smiles per kid ratio at Kidzania much is higher. higher than any other experience in the world. And that is an experience. It's, it's something where people get to spend their time, they enjoy their time doing that. And what happens in, in today's experience economy, where experiences are the predominant economic offering, is that goods and services are everywhere being commoditized. People are buying goods and services at the lowest possible price in order to spend their hard-earned money mm -hmm. and their hard-earned time on the experiences that they enjoy. And, and how, you know, you've been traveling around Asia quite a bit. Now, how, how do you see this? You know, Asia is very mass, you know, in terms of everything that we do, in terms mm -hmm. of the manufacturing service and so on. Right. How do we translate some of the insights that you've got over here in Asia? I mean, are there good examples that you have in, in Asia? Well, I mean, there, there, are, there are good examples all over the world because you think about the number one sector of the experience economy is actually tourism. And tourism employs about 10% of the people yep. the world over. And so and we can all learn for what are the techniques that they are using to do that. You think, for example, out of Hong Kong, like the Mandarin Oriental Hotel. I mean, yes, it's very high end. I mean, it's not like Kidzania when you're there. But one of the things they do is, and where you see the customization is work, is they have a profile on every person that stays there. And when you check into a hotel, no matter where you are in the world, they'll download that profile and look for things that you prefer and ensure that they then take care of you in a very personal manner. It's important to realize that experiences happen inside of us. It's our reaction to the events that are staged in front of us. So the more you, you make personal those experiences, the more engaging they're going to be. You know, hold that thought. We'll be right back here on the Leader on Mix Show with Joseph Pine. Welcome back. I'm with Joe Pine, speaker and consultant. Joe, you were talking about experiences. Tell us, I mean, many CEOs don't understand the power of, of creating those experiences, those, those transactional moments with the customer. Tell us a bit about why it's so important. It's probably the most critical element, I mean, in your, in your view at least, uh, to business success. It, it is absolutely critical because, because, again, goods and services are being commoditized. I mean, if people want to buy you just on price, then you have no differentiation. So in order to create differentiation, you have to shift up what I call this progression of economic value from commodities to goods to services and now to experiences in order to differentiate yourself, in order to create greater economic value within your customers. But you know, most, most leaders will say it's expensive, it's hard. Yeah. You know, if I already got this market, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm, I'm dominant in this market, why should I change? Well, be, uh, business is hard. Business gets tougher year after year. And if you don't change, if you keep doing the same things, if you stay in the illusory safety of past practices, then mark my words, you will be commoditized. So that's why you need to shift up and figure out how you can create more economic value by shifting toward experiences. Mm. And, and if somebody want, wanted to build a business, I mean, say a young person who's just coming out of university or school and says, look, I want to build an experience-based business. I want to be an entrepreneur. You know, what sort of advice would you give that young person? Right. What's interesting, you know, I, I was recently in uh, Helsinki, Finland, and I had this very nice meal in this restaurant. And, and, and it was very experiential because every meal, every part of the meal was telling the story about a trip in the woods through Lapland. And all of a sudden though, it wasn't our waiter, it was the owner of the restaurant who was telling the story. And he, he told me that he owned that business as an entrepreneur because of my book, The Experience Economy. 
that he read it when he was in college and says, that's what I want to do. So I want to get the got experience a, business. You probably got a female there. That's right. I got a female <laughs> and the royalties and that. So, so first thing is to really decide what business are you really in? What business as an entrepreneur you want to get into, but recognize the greatest value is going to be with experiences. And there's so much opportunity with experiences. In fact, the last book I wrote is called Infinite Possibility. Uh, and that book is about how you use digital technology to create experiences that fuse the real and the virtual. And, and if I were looking at a place to go, I mean, if the world was, was totally open, that's the intersection I would look at, the intersection of the physical and the digital, and how you use things like augmented reality and yep. virtuality with the Oculus Rift and with Microsoft's new uh, HoloLens yep. and things. How do you create experiences that are simply not possible in reality because of the advent of digital technology? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an extremely changing world today. Um, and you, you kind of bring forth. Tell us a bit about your last book. I mean, you, you mentioned the infinite possibilities, yep. right? So what does that, I mean, in, in terms of me as a business owner, what does that mean? Um, right, well, it means that you really have to discover exactly the right opportunity for you to pursue amid this infinite possibility that is available to us. And, and at the core of, of the book is, is, a, is a very humble framework, I like to describe it, because it merely attempts to redefine the known universe. You know, because all of our experiences in the known universe are built on the three fundamental dimensions of time, space, and matter. Mm -hmm. What digital technology does is it allows us to flip each of those. Matter is about atoms. Now we can use bits to be able to create new experiences. Uh, uh, space is about real places. Now we can have virtual experiences in virtual places that simply don't exist in reality. And time is about the actual events that unspool before us moment by moment. But with digital technology, we can, we can get rid of the tyranny of time. We can have autonomous events where we can explore the past, we can envision the future, we can hyperlink time in ways that we can. And, and it's the intersection of all six of these things. You focus on all of it at one time and figure out what's, what are experiences that really fuse the real and the virtual. So you can no longer tell where it is, but you know that you've created something that was not possible for, that's never been done in the world. Oh, that's amazing. You know? Joe, we're going to come back right after this for the Thinkonomic Challenge, where we're going to challenge you to some grueling questions. Super, super. So we'll be right back here on The Leadonomic Show with Joe Pine. Welcome back. I'm speaking to management advisor Joe Pine. Joe, we're going to subject you to the all Thinkonomics right. Challenge. So we're going to get the dice and, the, and the, all the stuff. <laughs> you've, got, you've got 30 seconds to answer. And the first challenge uh, is from giving. So here's a question. Which is more genuine, giving your time or giving your money? You know, I think you would think most everybody would answer that as, as giving your time and talents and that sort of thing. But if you look at, at it, you know, if my talent is being able to make money mm -hmm. and then I can give to some organization where they have somebody who has the talent of actually doing things, which is not my cup of tea, yep. then, uh, <laughs> then I think that that's a better, that for, so for me, that would be more authentic. Yeah. And you've got people like Bill Gates with his foundation. And yeah, yeah, yeah. People. Great, so let's, uh, you did that in less than 30 seconds, well done. You know? <laughs> well, <laughs> now we have go. to wait though. Well, it's okay, you know, we'll, okay. We'll, we'll, we'll assume that you've got right. 30 seconds there. So, Here's the second question. Would you rather have less work to do or more work you actually enjoy doing? Um, when, when you do what I do, I, you know, I love work. You know, I love figuring out what's going on in the world, developing frameworks that first uh, 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 describe what's going on and then prescribe to companies what they need to do about it. So I love doing work. Now, of course, I include in that research, you know, researching experiences around the world, doing a lot of reading in that, but figuring stuff out is what, what I really love and enjoy and excel at. All right, great, and, and there you go. All right. And the final 30 seconds, and here's the final question. If you could bring one character to life from your favorite <laughs> book, who would it be? Well, my favorite book, I assume you're talking fictional book, right? My yeah. favorite book is Lord of the Rings. Okay. You know, I'm a big Tolkien fan, love Lord of the yep. Rings. I was in New Zealand two years ago, went so to Hobbiton, Hobbiton and that. Yep. So, but you know, what character would you pick? You know, Aragorn, uh, Frodo, but I would have to go with Gandalf. Ah, okay. right? In fact, I've been called Gandalf more than once by a few people and, and so I identify Because of the with wisdom him. or because the, of well, the... Well, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully because of the, of the wisdom, uh, perhaps because of the power that he has. And, but a lot of it is he, he really feels for Middle Earth. He has a desire, his purpose in life 
is saving hobbits from mm -hmm. the greater disasters that are going on mm -hmm. around that, and, and, and that I love. So do you feel that it's your mission in life to help companies to understand exactly. this whole Right, I'm trying to help companies, amidst all the disasters of the world of business, find their way and be able to find you know, safe yeah, harbors that would allow them to excel. To, to especially in this space of experience. Huh? Exactly. Now, and, and if you were addressing a group of CEOs, yeah. and you, know, you had like a minute to give them okay. two nuggets of wisdom. So we do this um, twice. Yeah, I can do that twice. <laughs> yeah. What what sort of you know takeaways would you give them, or what sort of advice or nuggets of wisdom? Right. Would you well, well, what, you know, we talked earlier about deciding to be in the experience business, and once you've done that, um, for whatever experience you're creating, one of the things you need to have is a theme, and it's the organizing principle of the experience. It doesn't have to be as in your face as a theme restaurant. It doesn't have to be as fantasy as Disneyland, but it's simply what's the organizing principle of your experience. And that allows you to decide what's in the experience and what's out. And if you don't have that, you, you'll, you'll throw in everything but the kitchen sink, we say, right? So you need a cohesive experience with, with a theme. And the second thing I would point to is that understand that, that when your work is staging experiences, when, when your business is staging experiences, your work is theater. Hmm. And it's not a metaphor. I don't mean work as theater. I literally mean your work is theater. So you need to direct your workers to act. You need to help them uh, develop characters that they play. You need to give them, uh, help them characterize their roles. You need to have, have dramatic action. You, know, you can't just have a, a flat experience that goes like this where nothing much happens. Rather, you need to build up to a climax and come back down again. And that drama is what's going to be engaging. It's what's going to create an intense experience. And it's predicated on the theater that your people provide. Absolutely great, great insight. Joe, thanks a lot for being here on the show. I mean, they're terrific insights, which I've learned a ton from. My pleasure, Roshan. We've been speaking to Joseph Pine, management advisor, speaker, and author here on the Leadernomics Show.